Hello from South Carolina and welcome to dronesandsc.com. Today we're going to discuss some frequently asked questions about the Q500. For those of you that don't know, the Unique Q500 is a new aerial photography and video platform that was just released around Christmas of 2014. To get an idea of what it's capable of, visit our YouTube channel and our website at dronesandsc.com. So without further ado, let's take a look. Alright, so this is the Unique Q500. Uh, there's plenty of unboxing videos uh, and introduction videos out there, so I don't want to uh, belabor this, but this is just a quick overview for those uh, of you who are not familiar with the Q500. So, in the box with the Q500, uh, Unique has really given you everything you need to get out there and fly. You don't have to buy anything extra. I'm, I mean, they've really given you everything uh, from the quad and the props, and they give you four spare props, they give you uh, currently two batteries, uh, which is a special at some point, I guess they're just gonna offer the one battery. The controller, uh, there's a charger for the controller, there's a charger for the LiPo batteries, uh, they give you an AC power adapter for this, they give you a cigarette lighter adapter so you can charge it in your car, they give you this uh, neck strap right here, which uh, is designed, these little spreaders are designed to keep the uh, lines out of the way of your line of sight with the screen so you can see the screen. They give you uh, some tools to help you uh, take off the props. They give you a programming cable. They give you a uh, 8 gig class 10 SD card. And they give you this uh, sunshade right here. So they really have given you everything you need. That being said, there's always a uh, after you've been flying, there's always some things that you might want to add or do to it. So let's start talking about uh, some of those things and a lot of the questions that uh, I keep seeing come up, coming up on uh, Facebook and uh, RC groups and whatnot. So I guess the first thing let's talk about is the camera. So the camera is a gimbal 3-axis camera. It comes with this little protector. You can just slide that off and that just kind of helps it in transit not to vibrate all over the place. Now the camera is a uh, full three axis gimbaled camera so you're gonna have really super stable video with this. Now um, the way that it works there is a Wi-Fi transmitter or transceiver embedded in the camera as well as the antenna and that transmits on 5.8 gigahertz Wi-Fi and that transmits directly to your ST10 controller which has a uh, embedded four and a half inch Android tablet inside of it. Uh, and another thing I suggest doing is uh, protecting your screen. Uh, I had some GPS screen protectors sitting around and I just threw one on here. Any four and a half inch screen protector will work quite well on the uh, ST10 and you just want to protect that so it doesn't get scratched up and you can you know you can get these screen protectors really cheap I think I got like a pack of three or four on eBay for four dollars so we talked about how the video gets to the ST10 and one question I keep seeing coming up is uh, well can I put on some uh, FPV goggles and when I tell someone that the way that it's, it works, it's not really set up for FPV goggles, uh, a lot of people don't understand. They say, hey, I've got 5.8 gigahertz FPV goggles, it should work fine. But that's not the case. So most of these FPV goggles, they're not Wi-Fi. That's a, Wi-Fi is a standard of transmission. It's a computer protocol, an internet protocol, so it sends information back and forth. So this camera sends a packet to your Android and then the Android acknowledges and sends it back to the camera saying, hey, I received that packet. So it's bi-directional. It's a two-way form of communication, just like being on the internet. Most of the FPV goggles, they're just a straight video transmission. It's like watching a TV. It's one way. So com two completely different protocols, uh, just because they're the same frequency does not mean that they're going to work. Uh, as a ham radio operator, I can bring up radio on 5.8 gigahertz and transmit Morse code. 
but that Morse code is not going to control my camera. Completely different protocol. Same thing. So a lot of people have been asking, well, how could I do FPV goggles? Um, I have not attempted any goggle solution, but being that it is a Wi-Fi uh, protocol, my uh, Android cell phone will easily connect to the camera with the CGO2 app, which you can download uh, from Google Play, and I believe there is also a, an, an iPhone version. So you could connect uh, a Wi-Fi device with video out, something that has video out, and then output that to some goggles. Um, one thing you do want to be aware of is that you do not want to have more than one device connected uh, to your camera at the same time because then it's double the bandwidth that it's got to send because it's sending and receiving and acknowledging packets from two different devices. So if that was the case, I would uh, disconnect my video from my ST10 and just use the goggles. Uh, you would lose something with that. Um, you would have to still have to look at your ST10 for your on-screen display for telemetry because that is not sent as a video signal. That's sent as a data signal that is overlaid onto your uh, ST10 display. That would not show up in FPV goggles if you were just uh, connected with Wi-Fi. So I have connected my phone um, with the CGO2 app and it works fine. Another thing people have asked is, well, what if I put a, another, what if I put a whole FPV system on the uh, Q500? That is something that you could do. Uh, you would need, well, there's two options. Uh, a couple of people have been asking uh, where the video out signal is and could they just tap into the video out signal and run that into a FPV transmitter. And I haven't seen uh, the technical drawings for it, but I'm pretty sure that you would have to get inside the camera because the Wi-Fi transmitter for video is not inside the body, it's inside the camera. So it's all internal in there. So that would be difficult. I think the only feasible option if you wanted a whole FPV system would be to mount a camera somewhere else and mount a transmitter somewhere else. And then that brings a whole nother problem. So your control system is 2.4 gigahertz and your cam and your uh, Wi-Fi camera is 5.8 gigahertz. Most of your FPV transmitters are on 5.8 gigahertz. So, <clears throat> if you did put in a 5.8 gigahertz FPV transmitter, the, they're gonna it's gonna be on the same frequency as the camera, and it's very likely they would interfere with each other and drastically lower the range, or you may not get anything at all, uh, at least from the camera. If you do another system is 2.4 gigahertz, that's a big no-no. Control system is 2.4 gigahertz. If you put an FPV transmitter on that same frequency, it's going to overload the front end of the receiver inside the Q10 and it'll go out of control when you lose it. So definitely do not do 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, there's the other two options would be 900 megahertz or 1.2 uh, gigahertz. So with 900 megahertz, I don't see any problems with that. The antenna would be a little bit bigger because it's a longer wavelength, but it's a big quad, can handle it. And 1.2 gigahertz, you could do that system, but you need to make sure that you have a notch filter on your transmitter because the next harmonic from 1.2 is 2.4 gigahertz. And if that harmonic is strong enough, again, it would overload your 2.4 system and you could potentially lose control. So these are things to, uh, to be aware of. If you look on the bottom here, see if you can see it. <clears throat> this is your compass module right here. If you were to put an FPV transmitter in, you would not want the antenna here because the, that signal could uh, affect your compass reading and again make your Q500 uncontrollable. And you don't want to put it on this side because this is your 2.4 gigahertz receiver which actually controls your flight. So you want to move, put your FPV antenna really far away from either one of those. So that's enough about FPV. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the Wi-Fi password. So on the uh, Q500, it defaults uh, to a Wi-Fi password of 12345678900. That's the Wi-Fi for the camera. They all come that way and uh, I guess if someone was malicious enough, they could easily connect to your 
Wi-Fi signal if they knew that you were flying a Q500 and could uh, take control of your camera. And then again, if you have more than one device connected to it, that's drastically gonna slow down your video. Now, it's not a problem with a bunch of people flying Q500s, even though if the password is the same, it's still a, a unique identifier. So it's gonna connect to just your Q500. But that being said, I think you probably want to change your Wi-Fi password because uh, you don't want anyone else logging into your video stream, seeing what you're seeing and slowing everything down. All right, so changing your Wi-Fi password is pretty easy. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to do that on the computer in a minute, but the very first thing you wanna do uh, before you go to change your password is put your SD card in your camera and power up the unit. Uh, go ahead and connect to it with the uh, directions provided using the standard 12345678900 password. Uh, once you've got all that done, go ahead and power off your unit and then you're going to go and get your SD card. Let's talk about the SD cards here just for a minute. Now there have been a few reports of people accidentally putting the card in these uh, vent holes and then the cam uh, card being stuck in the body. Just so you know, the SD card port is the one right here uh, where it says SD and it's spring loaded. You just push in and it pulls right out. Uh, the easy way to remember how to put it in, the little gold contacts, they go down. It's kind of at a little angle, it angles up here. Push it in, here it click. And that's locked in. All right, so we're going to take this card out. And now you're going to connect this card uh, to your card reader on your computer, and I'll show you what to do now. So changing your Wi-Fi password is very easy. Uh, all you have to do is insert your SD card into your computer. Uh, if you have an SD card reader built in, that's great. If not, you can use uh, the USB SD card reader uh, just to access that folder. And I use this particular SD card for multiple cameras, so I may have some different folders than you have. But you want to look for the MISC or miscellaneous folder, open that up, and inside you will see a file called wireless.com. That's your wireless configuration file. Go ahead and open that, and um, if it doesn't know what type of program to use, uh, just use Notepad or Word or something like that. So you could say right click, open with, Notepad. Mine's already set up to do that, so open it up with Notepad, and you'll see here, this is the Wi-Fi configuration file, it uses WPA encryption. Now there are uh, specific requirements for what your password has to be. It has to be between 8 and 63 characters, and here is the default password, 12345678900. To change that, just simply erase this and create a password that meets the requirements of 8 to 63 characters. So let's do Q500 1234. We'll go ahead and save this, close it, and disconnect our uh, USB adapter. Okay, so we've made the changes on the card. Let's go ahead and put it back in again. Easy way to remember, the gold contacts, they are aimed down. If you try to aim them up, it just will not slide in and lock in. The card can only go in one way. So just gently move your camera to the side, and there you go, locked in place. And also, uh, the first time I had, uh, I pulled this card out, I accidentally smudged the lens. So just be careful, don't cover. Uh, the lens with your fingers or anything like that because uh, fingerprints on a lens is not a good thing. All right, so let's uh, go to the binding procedure and uh, for resetting our new Wi-Fi password. All right, so when you're doing anything in the settings uh, of the Q500, it's probably a good idea to take your props off. Uh, it's unlikely that you will have an accidental start, but better safe than sorry. Uh, aside from hitting the start and stop button, there is also another way to start the Q500. If you take both of your controls uh, diagonally down, it will start the unit. So keep that in mind. All right, so we've got our new uh, password loaded onto our SD card. The first thing we're going to do is power up our ST10 and power up our Q500.
we're uh, waiting for it to power up, uh, another question I've been asked is, what kind of SD card should I use? So it comes with an 8 gig class 10 card. 8 gigs is okay to start out with, but you're gonna fill that up in a flight or two. So I use a 64 gig card. Uh, it can handle up to 128 gigs, but that's really overkill, and the 128 gigabyte cards are pretty expensive. Uh, this is the card I use right here. This is a SanDisk Extreme 64 gig micro SD XD card. Uh, it is super fast. I've had no problems with it. You can get these for 40 bucks on eBay. I highly suggest it. All right, so on our screen here, you're gonna see that it says RC completed and video Wi-Fi connecting. On the top, it says unable to connect to camera. That's because we've changed the password on the camera, but not on the ST10. So in order to do this, we're gonna hit the flight settings button. You'll get a warning that you're exiting the uh, data telemetry screen and you're disconnecting from the aircraft. Uh, you don't ever wanna do this when you're flying, obviously. Uh, when you do that, uh, it cuts off the control signal to the Q500 uh, and it will go to its return home position, wherever that is. So we're on the ground, I'll go ahead and click OK. Click on bind, you'll see your camera right here, go ahead and click that. Connection failed, unable to connect to camera, retry. No, it does that sometimes, I'll try it one more time. There we go. And then we're gonna enter in our, enter in our password, which was Q, and then I have to hit the number sign to get my numbers up here. Q500, one, two, three, four, done. I can click show password if I want to make sure I uh, entered it right, click OK. And it said connection failed, unable to connect to camera, please retry. So we'll try it one more time. Now nine times out of ten, this procedure will work. Uh, if it does not work, then you just simply need to do the full bind procedure. So we'll try this one more time to make sure it works. If it doesn't, well, then we'll do the uh, full bind procedure. Okay, so it looks like we're gonna have to do the full bind procedure. So in order to do that, go ahead and turn your ST10 off and turn your Q500 off. So I've reset the battery and we're gonna go ahead and put the Q500 in bind mode. To do that, our ST10 is off and we're gonna turn on the Q500. And before you pick it up, uh, wait till you get the green light on the camera, it goes through its little self-test self and, move around, and uh, moves around. If you pick it up and uh, put it into bind mode, the camera might kind of get stuck in, in an awkward direction like aiming straight down. Probably not going to hurt it or anything, but it just looks silly. Alright, we've got a green light on our uh, camera now, and you can see our status light is flashing blue. In order to put it into bind mode, you pick up the Q500 and angle it forward 45 degrees twice in a row. And then you should see the status light change to orange. That is how you know you're in bind mode. Status light has changed to orange. We're in bind mode. All right. So let's come over here to the ST10 and take a look. Okay, our Q500 is on and in bind mode, and now we're gonna turn on our ST10. All right, so we've come up to our screen here that says it's trying to connect to everything. We're in bind mode, so we've gotta make it connect. Go ahead and hit your uh, bottom right button, your back arrow. Go to model select. Uh, you'll get a warning that says exiting flight data telemetry screen will disconnect you from the aircraft. Are you sure you want to exit? So if you were airborne and you did this, this is basically turning off your control signal. Uh, on that loss of control signal, the Q500 would uh, return to home. Uh, wherever it got its initial GPS lock. So we're on the ground, let's go ahead and click OK. Click your Q500. You're back on your main screen, hit your back button. Go to flight settings, click OK. Uh, you can go to camera select, you shouldn't have to do anything here, but just make sure your CGO2 is the one that is selected. Uh, CGO1 is the older camera. Uh, Q500 comes with a CGO2. If it's not selected, go ahead and hit that and hit and uh, CGO2 and hit select. We've got the right one selected, so let's go back and let's go to bind. So this is our Q500 and this is our camera. So let's go ahead and bind our Q500. Syncing model data, connection established. So now the radio control is connected or is synced with the uh, Q500. And for the camera, let's go ahead and click here. And it's asking for our password. So this is gonna be our new password that we changed. 
go ahead and click that password area and enter in your password. So we had Q500123. Hit done. And I can uh, click show password here just to make sure I entered it right. I did. Click OK. Connecting to the flight system and connection established. Go ahead and pick the back arrow again. Back out of this. Everything should connect. And there we are. We're all connected. Another thing that you can uh, do on the screen, uh, your frame rate. Uh, I know there was a couple of people that thought you had to go into system settings to change this. Uh, all you have to do is hit this button right here and you can pick your frame rate, 48, 50, or 60 frames a second. There's 48. Take it back to 60. Okay, this next section is geared towards those of you who are new to the hobby or perhaps have been away from it for a long time. What we're going to be talking about in this section is batteries, more specifically lithium polymer or LiPo batteries. This is the battery that the Unique Q500 uses. It's a 3S lithium polymer battery. 3S means it has three cells. That provides us 11.1 volts. Now, the batteries, according to Unique, are rated at 5400 milliamp hours or 5.4 amp hours. They had a sticker that went over this that said that. I peeled it off because it was kind of getting in the way. So it looks like originally they were thinking that they were going to be a 6300, but they are a 5400 according to all the documentation. So a lithium, lithium polymer battery, you can charge it at a rate of 1C. That means 1C means the current rating of the battery. So at 5400 milliamp hours or 5.4 amp hours, we can safely charge that at a rate of up to 5.4 amps. Now the charger that Unique provided us, uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, they gave us an AC adapter so we can charge it at home. They gave us a DC adapter so we can plug it into the car. But it does have some limitations that we need to talk about. The current rating of this uh, charger is 3.5 amps. Now I told you that you could safely charge our battery at up to 5.4 amps. So that means it's going to take a little bit longer to use this charger than whether if you used a uh, your own charger that could output at a higher current rating. Now, one thing that you do have to concern yourself with when using uh, lithium polymer batteries is balancing them. So there's three cells, and you want each of them to have the appropriate voltage. Now, for a lithium uh, polymer battery, uh, 3.7 volts per cell is your normal normal voltage and 4.2 volts per cell is your maximum voltage and you never want it to go below 3 volts per cell. So if you were to just charge it through these uh, through the negative and positive connector which is called a uh, EC3 connector in this pr particular implementation there's no way for the charger to analyze or notice the individual cell voltages. It's just gonna apply the voltage overall. That's where this charger and other chargers come in with a balance connector. So this is the balance connector and this is the only uh, way that the uh, unique charger works. It charges through the balance connector. So you just plug this in like so and that's how it charges. This device, this charger that uh, Unique provided only charges. I don't know, I fly several other models, uh, helicopters and planes, and uh, I have multiple chargers. Uh, this is a uh, one of the chargers that I use, and you really should pick up one of these, and I'll tell you why. There's several reasons. First of all, you can use this charger for anything. You can it's a smart charger. You can program it for any kind of battery you want to use. A nickel cadmium, uh, LIFE, lithium ion, lipo, lead acid, it does it all. And this one can charge up to a rate of 5 amps. And uh, it's in, in my field kit. The way that this works 
is uh, inside my kit there's basically a motorcycle battery and that's what powers my individual chargers so I can I can go for a whole weekend off the charge in my uh, onboard battery but I can also plug it into the wall or I can plug it into my car battery so one of the other great things about having a charger like this go ahead and sit that there is you can do some other functions with it it's gonna tell you how many uh, amps you have put into the uh, battery it's got various safety functions you can even plug in a USB uh, to your computer and monitor performance of your batteries over time now one unique thing about with the Impolymer batteries is number one you don't want to over discharge them and number two you do not want to store them fully charged that's the problem with having just a charger like this it's great to charge your batteries but there's no storage function with a smart charger it will put it into storage voltage which is basically half of the rated voltage and the reason why you don't want to store the uh, lipo is fully charged as it will over time it could just be a few days if you leave a battery like this fully charged for a week you can seriously degrade the capacity of it and it won't last as long it basically shorts out the inside of the battery with a smart charger you always want to keep your batteries at half charge or at storage voltage until maybe the day of or the night before you use them then go ahead and take them up to full charge Another thing that you want to do is you never want to leave a LiPo battery alone while it's charging. There have been cases where they have caught on fire. Uh, it's less common these days. Uh, they know how to make them pretty good, but it is still a caution that you need to be aware of. This is also especially true if you ever let a, the voltage get too low on a cell. The uh, cells can expand and once uh, they break and the air hits them, that's when they catch on fire. So you cannot let a cell get below three volts per cell or nine volts total for this particular model. Okay, now the last thing we're gonna talk about is using the included USB programmer and the GUI or graphical user interface. So Unique has provided us a software program to enable us to check on the Q500 status, uh, see how things are going with it, upload firmware updates, and make a few changes. Now the way you do this is you have to get your USB programmer cable. Now on the end of this cable, uh, at least in my box, uh, this little adapter was plugged into it and it says that the adapter is for the USB interface gimbal adapter lead. So that has to do with the camera. I have not messed around with it. Not sure what you can do there yet. So go ahead and disconnect that cable and you're gonna have just your one piece of cable connected to your USB adapter. In the back of your quad, go ahead and open up your battery compartment, and in the top right inside, you're going to see some cabling that's got some Velcro that's keeping it against the side of the body. Using the included tweezers, you're going to take that cabling, and pull it out. And here's what it looks like. There we go, right there. So here's the piece of Velcro right there. There's the Velcro and there's the cable that you're gonna disconnect. So carefully, uh, don't pull on the cables, pull on the actual uh, adapters on the end. Disconnect the cable. And then you're gonna plug your USB programmer adapter into the quad. Like so. Right, so on your computer, you're gonna load up your Q500 GUI and you can get this from unique.com. Go ahead and load up your program. Now go ahead and maximize that. So it tells you for the first time, if you don't have the USB driver installed, find the latest version and it gives you a hyperlink. Click here and install it. So that's the first thing you need to do. I've already done that. Rest and then restart your computer. Uh, make sure your Q500 is turned off. And then get your communication adapter and plug it in. So we've 
plug in our adapter. And now you need to slide the battery back in with this cable pulled out in order to power it. So just kind of hold the cable to the side and just go really slow with it. Don't want to pull on it too hard. There is enough room, but it is tight. Got the battery in. So it says slide the battery back into its compartment and turn on the quad rotor. The GUI will then connect to it. Let's go ahead and turn it on. As soon as it turns on, you saw that it went through its self checks here of all the sensors the IMU, the pressure sensor, the compass, the GPS, and the speed controllers. So all those. We got a green check mark, it's good to go. Now, all this data here, this is showing you what's going on with the accelerometers, temperature, what the compass is reading, what our pressure sensor is at, and what it's estimating my feet is in, in meters. So we can change this over to feet in degrees Fahrenheit. Now there's some other options on the screen. For instance, if I go to GPS information, I'm inside the house and I'm already locked in on all kinds of satellites. And I've got three feet of accuracy and it's getting better and better. So the uh, GPS receiver on this unit actually receives all the navigation satellites from my understanding, European and Russian. So. This make, gives it a real advantage on getting really quick locks. I mean, that took three seconds to get a very accurate lock, and I'm indoors. We can go on device information, and that tells me that I've got the latest version of my GUI and the latest version of firmware. Now, when the firmware comes out, you can download it from uh, unique.com. Download that file locally. You'll click on firmware update, and then you just say, you tell it where the firmware is, and it will update it to your uh, to your Q500. So some other things that you can do on this screen, on your calibration screen, there are two things that you can change. So this is my current value. I can uh, geofencing. This is in the smart mode. It will not let you. Uh, fly any further than that. So this is maximum distance from home point in smart mode. I currently have it set to 2,001 feet. If I wanted to change that, I can simply enter in the number here, or I can use the uh, arrow key, and I hit update, and it updates it. For a height limit, uh, I have it set out at a max of 3,281 feet. Now I fly oftentimes in mountainous terrain, and this uh, height limit is based on from where you take off so it, it doesn't know how high it is above the ground it just knows how high you are from takeoff so the FAA strongly recommends that you do not exceed 400 feet so unless you're in some mountainous terrain and you're following the requirements uh, it's best to leave this at 400 feet and then back on sensor information um, if I ever another neat thing you can do here is you can enable testing of your uh, electronic speed controllers and your motors. This shows you the direction that they're supposed to turn. And if I click on enable testing, I've got a warning that pops up. Please confirm that you want to enable motor testing. Put the quad on a stable surface and remove all four propellers. Acknowledge and click OK. Now all you do if you click on the appropriate motor, it will spin that motor uh, at a low RPM and in the proper direction. If for some reason it goes in the wrong direction or doesn't turn at all, then there's a problem. So that was the left, top left, back left, back right, and forward right. So I left the props on just so you could see how that works um, but you should take your props off uh, or at least uh, make sure that nothing is around 
So that's the GUI. Once you're done using this, just close it out. Turn off your Q500. And then just disconnect your interface. Pull your battery out. Carefully disconnect your cable. Reconnect the cable that was there. And make sure it's on there good. And then just push this back up in the top right corner, being sure that uh, the Velcro is touching the Velcro inside the Q500 and that this battery isn't hanging down over the battery compartment. Now you can use the tweezers. I can usually get this pretty good with my finger. I'll get it started where I want it with the uh, tweezers and then I'll just give it a good push with my finger. It's totally out of the way. Make sure the battery slides in free. It's not touching anything. Cable's out of the way. And then anytime you use the GUI, you need to make sure that you turn your quad back on and uh, make sure that it works okay and it connects to your controller. Thanks for watching our video on frequently asked questions about the unique Q500 Typhoon. I know we covered a lot, so if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me at contact at dronesandsc.com. You can also reach us on our YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter. If you like the video today, there's a lot more coming. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and let us here at dronesandsc.com help you realize your dreams of flight.